So I'm honored here to be uh, moderating this first panel of Aracon. This is pretty awesome. Uh, we'll start with just some introductions. I'll model for you guys. Uh, I'm Griff Green. Uh, I started the, the space in the DAO with Slocket, uh, you know, helping to build the DAO and then actually helping to clean it up with the White Hat group. And uh, currently, I'm working with Dapnode, IDEN3, Tenagraph, and uh, of course, Aragon, as well as pushing Giveth forward to be a platform for altruistic DAOs. Um, that's the deal. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron. I'm here today because I work with Colony, another DAO project, very much focused on just working together on projects, doing your day-to-day -day management of what you guys do to really, yeah enable us to work together on the blockchain, less of a voting on proposals kind of model than more of a, you know, working, doing projects, but also very flexible. So we're going to see where this takes us. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Hi, I'm Yalda. Um, uh, I guess I'm part of Space Cooperative, Space Decentral, and now Autark. Uh, we were awarded a Nest grant last year, and we were just awarded for uh, the Flock funding for Autark uh, a week ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jacob uh, with uh, Tokpo Group, a uh, new organization that's building uh, tools and, uh, you know, basically tools that facilitate, like, uh, you know, the governance mechanism in, in uh, Tezos, uh, as well as uh, smart contract uh, tools. I'm Jeremy Macaluso. Um, I've been working with the Aragon DAC um, on getting uh, DAOs to be able to interact with external dApps, um, and I'm really excited to be here. Okay, so this panel is called New Types of Organizations, and we'll kick it off with, like, why? Like, what are the benefits of these or of new types of organizations? You know, we have lots of ways to organize right now in the current world, co-ops, nonprofits, corporations. Why do we need anything else? Um, well, I'd start with we don't know exactly what all the problems are that we're solving. It's just everyone working in this space has a real vivid sense that there's something new and something very powerful. So I'm reminded of when the web came about in the 90s. We didn't know exactly where it was going. We just knew this is a whole new scale of collaboration on a global scale. And um, I mean, it brought us projects like Wikipedia, which seemed completely insane when it was first pitched, like a website anyone can edit. How would you ever turn it into something like Wikipedia? And it succeeded. And it even made encyclopedias cool again. And nobody would have thought that was possible. Um, and what, you know, so you mentioned some organization types we have, which is great, but they're also very, very local. Often they require a lot of local interactions. There's a big hurdle to setting them up. You know, there's legal hurdles to setting up an organization, um, bureaucratic ones. Um, so I'm not saying like the, the barriers to entry in DAOs should be much lower. The scalability should be much lower and we can solve problems of global organization that we haven't even thought to address yet because it just didn't cross our minds that it, it would be possible to organize on such a scale. So that's sort of the vision, but I can't give you the concrete, this is what we're trying to solve, but we'll see it when we get there. Uh, yeah, I, I, when the way I think about it is um, actually in terms of what it prevents uh, the organization from doing, so sort of like the friction. Uh, actually, so uh, it's that it create. You know, th obviously, the cool thing is with this technology, it reduces the friction between uh, that. You know, and allowing people to, uh, you know, uh, collaborate and and you know, uh, join the same, uh, you know, DAO and whatnot. Uh, but it also is that it actually ties its own hands. So by preventing, by tying its own hands, you know, you basically uh, y you prevent uh, one entity from perhaps taking it over. And that was actually sort of alluded to uh, in the previous talk, basically, which is that uh, Aragon, you know, doesn't have to worry because it, you know, because you raise funds uh, doing a token sale, it doesn't have to worry, you know, the, the project doesn't have to worry about, um, you know, VC pressure and whatnot. And you actually, I, I've seen the same argument uh, from the folks at Decred. I've seen the same argument, you know, in, in the context of Tezos, um, and I've seen the same argument uh, in, in, in other uh, DAO context. It seems to me that it's really a lot of this is about uh, how we fund public goods and public goods probably, you know, like re realistically the way that we extract value in many networks is through uh, creating gatekeeping and, uh, you know, adding transaction costs, which has been, you know, especially a big problem in this space with like utility tokens and things like that. Um, and I see DAOs as like something that allow you to fund 
public goods without uh, introducing, uh, you know, because, because they introduce these frictions to um, sort of extracting rents, uh, they uh, are able to scale uh, much more widely and solve all sorts of public good problems that were previously intractable, potentially. I see DAOs as a way of um, allowing types of organizations that have previously been uh, very limited in terms of what they can um, accomplish without having to trust anyone to really scale to not need everyone to be in the same room um, to, to trust that um, the operations are going as they're supposed to be going, particularly um, organizations like co-ops um, that are supposed to allow everyone to um, participate equally to not need everyone to either be in the same room or to trust a particular server um, to be reporting correctly. Yeah, and I think um, definitely older legacy organizations, they have their limitations like the cooperative model. Like I'm, I have a worker-owned cooperative, but you start to like see the inefficiencies, like oh, if a co-op member becomes inactive, then you have to deal with talking to them and being like, okay, are you still gonna be a part of the organization? Like, what do you wanna do? Um, but if you were doing that more through kind of like participation via tokens, then it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to talk to the person. It's just kind of like in the code, whether you can participate in the governance or not, um, people can become active, inactive, and then it's just, you know, it's 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 not it's never it doesn't have to be black and white for like hey you should like leave the co-op or hey you should apply again it it can just be more fluid so yeah. um, that's what I've learned like just being part of a co-op for two years and really looking forward to evolving the co-op model with decentralized autonomous organizations. Yeah, so it's much more fluid. Like yeah. you can you don't have to be a member or non-member. Everyone can contribute as much time and effort as they want, and that allows you know that allows the organization to grow much more because it's. People can, you know, if, if you don't have to commit f fully to becoming a member, you can just start contributing time and effort, then it's much easier to, to join. And the organization can organically grow and or shrink, but adapt with time, depending on what people want to do with it, right? And you mentioned, like, global problems, I think. You just, so the hope, of course, is that these tools evolve to the point where we can solve big, huge global problems that we as a society have trouble addressing with our governmental and business institutions as they are today, right? These are coordination tools around common shared goals, and there are some really big shared goals that everyone would like to somehow get working on but doesn't know how to start. And um, I think the, the excitement of DAOs is it's really easy to just start and then develop a dynamic and internal, you know, internal dynamic and momentum to grow things, to keep the projects going forward. Uh, without needing permission up front, without needing a fully plan up front, right? Which, I mean, in this space, we all know we don't need a full plan to just get going. This is what all of, you know, here we are, right? But, um, yeah. yeah. All it takes is a white paper, right? And you're good to go. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so that's the what. Now, this is the, what's your favorite how? I mean, we have liquid democracy, futarchy, mer meritocracy, curation markets, and so many other cool decentralized governance models that we can do with DAOs. What are your guys' favorites? Who wants to, s who wants to start? Uh, yeah, so what we're working on um, is actually, so, so the way we approach it is that um, there's no one uh, mechanism. So we, are, you know, from the beginning, we've always acknowledged that, like, you know, in, in the Tezos uh, world, that voting is super naive uh, of, of a, an approach. Uh, and really what you want is probably, you know, multiple complementary mechanisms. So, uh, you know, we, we've already, you know, sort of been looking at doing, you know, something basically that's, so what, I, what, I, what I imagine at least would be something that uh, filters, uh, you know, amendment proposals via like a futarchic mechanism um, and then has like, you know, some kind of uh, voting uh, mechanism to approve it uh, with like a, sub a testing period and a subsequent approval. Um, and so then, and then have some kind of, you know, actual hard-coded constitutionalism. Um, and that's been discussed, um, you know, in, in a few, a couple of papers uh, by one of the founders of the protocol, uh, Arthur Brightman. Um, but the idea of having like sort of global constraints and then having complementary mechanisms. So one, Futarchy is really good for maybe like, you know, assessing does this proposal, uh, will it actually accomplish the goal that, um, you know, that, that uh, it's it set out to, to accomplish. Um, we have different ideas for target, you know, tar you know, what metrics to target and whatnot. 
Um, and then uh, you, know, you want something that encapsulates values, and that's what voting is actually decent for. It's good for expressing preferences and that sort of thing. So you have these kind of complementary mechanisms. And then you can even add something that's like even approximates hard fork governance uh, if you really want to be careful. And you can add uh, the, you know, something that requires that all nodes upgrade uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, a given uh, you know, you know, uh, amendment that's gone through this whole process. You know, so you say at the end of the process, OK, we'll activate the upgrade at uh, block, you know, this block block height, and then basically everyone, you know, has to, uh, if, you know, basically, or, or rather, we'll, we'll do it when, uh, you know, this many nodes, you know, this many nodes have upgraded. Uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, this sort of gets you out of this whole concern, like, oh, that, you know, uh, on-chain governance robs people of, you know, not node operators of, you know, governance rights. You know, you can actually just give them a veto right in the protocol. So I think it's a, a point is it's a complementary uh, system. Anyone who's sort of trying to tell you that it's, we should just <laughs> excuse me, just use voting or just use, or, you know, for at least for base layers, uh, just use voting or just use futarchy or something like that, I think is mistaken. It should be a complementary uh, mechanism. Um, I guess I have a preference towards a two-token system, uh, although some people might say that the other thing's not a token, but um, basically one to track contributions where you can't really transfer that balance to anyone else and the other one has value and that, that's transferable. Um, I think even Pando has some similarities to that as far as how that would work. Um, but why I think that is important because that fits with evolving the cooperative model because in, in a cooperative you, you like track someone's labor contribution and then whenever you're distributing revenue or profits it's based on how much that person put into the organization and whenever you leave a cooperative you can't really sell your contribution to that co-op it's like it's non-transferable it's like you're a member of a co-op and then if you choose to leave like you leave you can't like sell your equity to anyone else so i think that having that two token system um or whatever like a, a merit tracking the merit and then the value um, like how that's distributed to the members is what I think is gonna change a lot of things and um, I guess uh, and then with that you can do the governance through uh, the contributions instead of through how much uh, of the tokens you've acquired by purchasing them um, and for the the method that I like as far as how you how you uh, determine the voting power has to do with um, just like how active someone has been in the past three months, for example, just because like from our co-op, we're like, okay, yep. if you're gone for more than three months, you probably don't really know that much about what's going on to really make a decision on how to like spend our finances. So if you're kind of like active for the past three months, you can just do it based on like a weight of, are you kind of like part-time or full-time? Just like, keep it like very mm -hmm. simple. Yep. Yeah. Exactly how it would work in Colony, yeah. at least as described in the white paper, so where we're headed. Um, but I wanted to say, can step back and just sort of say in general, we don't need to reinvent everything. Like DAOs don't exist in a vacuum, and we already have tools to globally communicate and organize. You know, sometimes a Reddit forum is enough to get a huge amount of organization done. Um, so you know, we should use all those tools and uh, assume that the DAOs are embedded in that um, and not and also not every problem needs to be, you know, not every little piece of work has to be paid for and accounted for. We don't need, you know, we don't need to, just because we have programmable currency now, doesn't mean we have to pay for every little action and try to make sure every little action is paid because the incentives don't work like that. You know, people will do, it's amazing how much people will do for fake internet points. And, I, you know, I, I, I mean that seriously. Like, you don't need to get paid for something as if you have recognition. People would, you know, it's, as long as you're part of a community and working towards a goal, you don't have to, you know, start paying for things. And sometimes that actually destroys the dynamics if you start trying to pay for every little action because, it can, you know, that's, the market isn't neutral, right? It, it does distort the things that are traded in it. So I'd say we need to, be, that's just a general warning. Let's not try to over-tokenize everything. Um, and on the flip side, as like, smart contracts in the DAO design, like getting into the nitty gritty of it, I think it's also important that we don't over bureaucratize everything because it's really easy to come up with a very convoluted voting system and staking here and quorum requirements there. And because that's fun, the logic's simple, the contracts are easy to write. But you know, um, I come from an academic background and I know that when you're like in student parliament, you're surrounded by people who love procedure and arcane rules. and 
It's incredibly inefficient and slow and horrifying. And let's not recreate that on the blockchain, but try to make DAOs really lean and simple and flexible. And like, you know, don't use voting everywhere. It's voting is a good way to solve a dispute, but not to take a decision. Right? D decisions are made when you talk to people, when you have your hangout call, that not during a vote. So. I don't have a flex favorite method of the ones you named. They're just there's a general principles I would use when evaluating uh, what to use in a certain context. Uh, one of the one of the decision making mechanisms that I'm most excited about um, is is a form of voting, uh, proportional approval of voting. Um, but one of the things that I'm excited about from it is how simple it is for the average user. Um, all you have to do. Um, if you're participating in it, is decide which um, which things you approve of. Um, it's not it's it's not at all complicated, and using this system, um, which can be done automatically, um, you can still end up with a result that um, an, an allocation of resources um, that represents. Uh, the the voters proportionally. Um, it's, it's also it's really good for cons like if you really want to approximate consensus. Yeah. Uh, approval voting is like probably the best like that we have. Uh, yeah. You know for consent. Yeah. Like and reducing aside from I mean, quite track voting school, but reducing the yeah. cognitive load on the voters is very important. Right? Yeah. Because absolutely. proposals can be really long, and maybe you're really engaged in the DAO app for a while, but after you don't want to read all that, and you don't know how to judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I guess to another point would be like in, in a lot of these contexts, the main goal should be how do we prevent, you know, in, in a very like large scale organization, like how do you prevent bad ideas is probably the most impo single most important thing uh, that it's problem that you can solve for. And uh, approval voting is like probably one of the best mechanisms we have for that, um, that mm -hmm. yeah. type of thing. Well, okay. So keeping things simple for users is really important, obviously. And you know, this is one of the worries I think a lot of people who are more revolution mindset have the revolution mindset about like, okay, we can, you know, overthrow the elites and, and get rid of their uh, power structures and build our own power structures where the technically savvy are the elites and, you know, everything's going to work out well for them. Like, how do we stop that? You know, this is a real concern with uh, all the stuff. People don't understand blockchains. You know, how do we keep it simple for people and avoid just moving power from one group to, an, to a more technologically savvy group? Yeah, who wants to start <laughs> on that one? No, I, I, I think, I, I think that's, that's a good... <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> the, probably, probably the best we can do is ensure that we still have really easy exit and low friction to moving to new, uh, you know, new organizations, uh, you know, over time. So uh, what we want to, I think, want to make sure that we do is uh, avoid, uh, you know, sort of piling on all, like, all of the world's consensus into one, uh, you know, group of people. Like, you know, that's probably, you know, th th really, you, you just really want there to always be the ability to exit, not just, you know, a, you know exercise voice. I think that's... Well, I mean, okay. so infra we're trying to build something that's infrastructurally has multiple power centers and makes it harder to for any elite to capture. So it's true; it does take a, you know an elite to access to explain like the where it's a very raw technology and it requires a lot of technical savvy just to be able to participate, let alone create in the current environment. Um, but I mean, that same was true of the internet and the web when it started, but. You know, and that there's also a warning in that because it was built with the idea of a fully decentralized network. The internet was, you know, supposed to withstand nuclear war, and on an infrastructure level, that was um, true, right? You could take out half network, and every traffic would be routed around. But we've learned that that's not a guarantee, and we're getting more and more walled gardens on the internet, and censorship is getting better and better too. So. Um, while we are building in infrastructures that are, again, aiming to get to this decentralized, not just like, logically decentralized, but from a power perspective, um, it's not a guarantee that that's, it's going to stay that way. But it, it's something that is a, an elite project. It's not, you know, let's not deny that. But, um, Agree. That doesn't mean it's elitist. I think it's going to take a lot of media, like, 
partnering with Mr. Robot or just like putting stuff in movies more? Like you have to figure out how, how are you going to attract people that aren't technical? Like uh, media is the best way to do that, whether it's like real music, not just like jokey music about crypto, but it just kind of has to become more in the mainstream. And yeah, like Facebook needs to transition out. Maybe a DAO purchases advertisements on Facebooks and on Facebook and gets people to transition out of that network. But it's like, you know, it's like, I think it's just gonna be like propaganda but and People media. don't need to know about blockchains. That's no, as little as they need to know about packet it's switching. It's no. not about blockchain. <laughs> it's about more like participating in these networks. Like not, it's not an educational thing, but it's like, obviously like the technical people need to work on the user experience so you don't have to like install MetaMask and do this. And you know, it's like, mm -hmm. that's, that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is how do you actually reach out to the people and say like, this is, uh, w this is what's important for the future. This is what's important for humanity. Like it's mm -hmm. like uh, some kind of like vision. It has to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it remains something <laughs> that you need technical expertise to do, I, I don't see it really gaining any adoption outside of people who have the technical expertise already. Um, so building the UIs that make it not require um, technical expertise is a, high prior is a very high priority. Um, yeah, and once you get a sense of agency, like interacting with the system feels like this is now you can do something that you couldn't do before that could be a big selling point yeah. right? but yeah that's a challenge but it's a technical challenge to just get the interfaces there to get the infrastructure there to make dApps usable it, you know with colony we have that's a big problem with aragon i'm sure you you guys know, work on that all the time how do you you know how, how, if a click takes 17 seconds before it counts then you know, it's never going to work. And we can, every, all the rest of the theory about governance and voting and decentralization is out the door the, because that, that's, like, but we're at that stage of the technology. It's so raw that those really mundane technical hurdles are, are showstoppers. So, I mean, yeah. so one step at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you uh, stole my thunder. That was the next question, man. What, what are the next technical hurdles? You know, what, what are the priorities? What are the biggest technical hurdles that are, going to, that are slowing adoption? And what are the priorities to solve this year? You know, what is, what is the next hurdle we need to overcome to actually get there where people are participating? Feel free to get yeah, I, I think it's mostly uh, that we just we're flying blind, so we don't really know uh, we don't really know how these things actually uh, like what, what what actually happens when we when we use these uh, you know uh, technology that scale like, like so in, in the Tesla's case in our case it's um, you know we we're, we're planning to do an up, you know a first uh, upgrade uh, in the next uh, few months uh, you know where we're gonna have the first proposals uh, we you know already announced like we're probably gonna have the the actual code will be uh, you know released uh, publicly uh, very soon. Um, the, basically, I think we just need the actual experience to, uh, of seeing what actually happens uh, with, with these technology. I think, I think one uh, solution to, to a problem that I see, it, or one, one problem that I see is that um, we don't want to um, sort of pile on too much pressure onto like, say, you know, succeeding on, on one specific governance mechanism or something like that. So what I mean is, um, you know, we, we want to, I think, like distribute the risk uh, in, and have like a lot of small experiments with this technology because we can vary things quite a lot, you know. Uh, you know, vary, vary the, the feature set, vary the, um, the conditions in which we, we test them, uh, right? And, and we don't have to uh, rely on, um, you know, we, we, should, we should try to minimize as much as possible um, the amount that happens uh, in, in one place. Uh, obviously, in our, case, you know, in our case, it's, you know, we're a it's a base layer protocol. We're trying to, you know, so basically the, the, pr the changes that are proposed uh, are simply the change for the first proposals are just to change constants. So it's to change uh, the gas limit and to change uh, the size of uh, a role, which allows you to participate in Tesla's proof of stake. Um, basically, uh, we, you know, I think the idea behind that was like, you know, let's do a small scale experiment, see how it goes. Uh, and then, you know, there's, you know, all sorts of proposed, you know, potential changes to consensus, to uh, adding privacy features, all sorts of stuff that are like waiting uh, to be deployed um, by, you know, by the time these experiments are over, first experiments are over. No. Technical okay. hurdles. 
I, I think there's not one one hurdle that needs to be solved. There's there's a there's a large number of hurdles that um, need to be solved. Any one of which, until they're solved, will will be a showstopper. So that's the scalability of the UX, um, all, all those sorts of um, things that we're we're working on <laughs> solving, yeah. um, and we all we all know about. Yeah, no, UX is a huge one. Like, let's not underestimate these things are hard to interact with. But um, the other side is security. We now have to keep files safer than we've ever had to keep a file before. Um, and that's a really hard one. And you know, now we have to train people to write down seed phrases after telling them for 30 years never to write down a <laughs> password. Um, that's, that's a difficult one. And you know, phones are completely insecure. And so if we want, but everyone likes to interact with things from a mobile phone. So now we have to compartmentalize the security and you know, have stopgap measures in the smart contract level, in the app level, and that's, those are, I mean, that, that instantly gets hard from a UI, UI, UX perspective, from thinking about it, from training the users, you don't want to do too, have to do too much of that. So, but they go hand in hand, right? The, the UX is, one is hard because the, of the weird, you've no, no longer got a front end and back end, you've got a front end and a back end and another back end, which is blockchain and, you know, and, and how they interact, and it's slow, and they can get clogged. So we have to learn a whole bunch of lessons here, and there's a whole bunch of tooling missing that makes it easy. So there's like heavy lifting to be done. And then the flip side is, not the flip side, but the other issue is the security, and having to keep keys really safe needs a whole new way of, in, whole new concepts, f both for the user to interact with and for how to program. You know, you've got the, the there's a big, you know, tension between you want to make the keys really secure, so you try to restrict access to them as much as possible, but you want to make it that people don't lose their keys, so you have to keep many copies of them in multiple places, and those are kind of contradictory in some point. Um, I, I think that in many ways, the, um, the pr having users be uh, storing their seed phrases itself is a UX failure. Um, and there, there are alternatives in that um, we can build smart accounts mm -hmm. um, to that if you that have mul that take multiple keys from your laptop, from your from your smartphone, from your desktop, um, from an outside organization that you've chosen that you trust, um, so that if someone else gets access to your phone and takes your private key, you don't lose everything. Yeah. So that if you lose your phone in a river. Um, and that's the only place where you were storing your private, that particular private key, you can recover and you won't lose everything. Um, and there's, there's a lot that needs to go into that, but that's, um, it, it's not going to be one smart contract that people are using. It's going to be whole systems where you have one, one app that's handling multi-factor authentication and one app that's handling uh, credential recovery and one app that's handling uh, a, a, a unsafe wallet that is easier to use that you just need your smartphone for, but it might be lost if you lose your smartphone, but it doesn't have too much on it. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that we're not even close to feature parity with existing systems shows just how far away we are from the, these technologies being adopted. I mean, there's people who are doing really cool work on key management and, and that sort of thing, but mm -hmm. um, like it, like it just it, it feels to me like it, you know, first of all, you know, it hasn't really none of these things have been used at scale. We don't even know what kind of problems people are going to have you know, using even you know some of these elegant solutions. So yeah, I, I think it just goes to show that like, th this this space in general, I think, is just very very early not to be the yeah, everyone already knows that, but um, but but I think um, again, it's just down to like let's run the experiments and see what happens. Um, uh, wh one of the one of the coolest things, uh, you know, I think most of the coolest uh, experiments are coming in the next few months, actually. So you know, we have a lot of really cool stuff with with uh, you know you know from Dow Stack, from a clearly from Aragon, and then obviously on base layers, you know, like Tezos, Decred, uh, etc., uh, where we're gonna find we're going to find out, you know, what. Are the things that people have been writing abstractly in papers, you know, for the last few years, you know, even longer, five years, uh, as much as five, six years, like, are they actually like good ideas? Like, do they actually hold up? Uh, you know, and and also, I, I think one thing we one underestimated challenge that we have is 
do we have the right participants for these technologies? So like, you know, I think the composition of the people actually that, that um, are participating, like, do we know if it's representative of the larger world? So if it's a bunch of people who like, were paying attention from the beginning and always have known, like, you know, what, what the system, how it's gonna be designed, et cetera, like those people, um, you know, are, are, are compositionally just very different than the rest of the world. Um, and so we don't really know if, if like, you know, everything that we even learn in the early experiments will carry over to later experiments. Uh, so we need to find out how ways to uh, reach out, find you know, find ways to scale social. Uh, you know, I hate to use it, but socially scale uh, this this uh, you know these experiments to find out um, what happens when we bring in people from uh, you know you know who are who, who aren't familiar with this technology, um, and uh, you know do, does you know it's probably going to create uh, you know negative uh, network effects, right? It's probably, you know you're going to add a person and you're going to reduce the the quality of the the decision a little bit. Um, so we need to find ways to to avoid that. Um, and I guess my comment on it in general is maybe developing too fast before you know if what you're developing is what people want or what people need, um, especially because a lot of people have done ICOs. They have like 20 million, 100 million, and they have the freedom just to keep innovating, keep like releasing new features to the roadmap, but they don't have like the VC pressure to find product market fit. So it's like there are the pros and cons of that. You don't have to answer to someone, but then what if you're just in this like kind of Disneyland of like developing like this cool platform that no one ends up using. So I think it's like trying to, you have to like find the like the right balance between that is like are we just like uh, adding more features and like do people actually want it like how do we actually find a product market fit for what we're doing and it's like you might want to say this is not a product like it's not about finding the market it's like how do we like if, we're, if we want to change the world how do we actually make sure we're we're uh, measuring that as like a kpi or something <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> but to get product market fit sometimes you adapt the product to the market but sometimes it happens the other way around <laughs> So, I mean, also, yeah. can we really name can we name governance systems that have like really good product market fit? Because it's like a lot of times governance systems happen like arbitrarily and whatnot. And so now we have the ability to do it intentionally. But um, I, I guess the, the question is like, as I was saying before, like you know, are the people who are evaluating like I feel like there's the much more capability for self sorting in this system. So like the people who are going to be evaluating, you know, you can sort of imagine this archipelago, right? I think people have you know a lot of people have written about this idea of like you know that there will just be a lot. You know, the internet is going to enable like all sorts of like archipelagos of like self selected self-sorted uh, people with their own, you know, sort of sticky, uh, you know, affinities and, pr and preferences that cluster around like an institution that just fits them perfectly, right? Uh, and so, it, you know, that's really cool. And, and, and if they, if there, if there's like interoperability between all these different, um, like sort of juris, you know, internet jurisdictions someday, you know, um, I think that would be, that it might be that, you know, there, there is really high product market fit in the, you know, people will sort themselves into the, the systems that they, they want to be in. Um, the larger questions, I think, are like the meta, the meta protocols or the base layer protocols, like that govern all of this. Who controls those, and like what, what you know, basically uh, happens at that level. Um, but yeah, what I was alluding to the we don't since we don't know what all the use cases are, yeah. we can't optimize for those use cases yet. We, you know, so there, there. The, the the having funds available to those who have got you know had lucky. Uh, ICOs or who have funding from elsewhere, it is a freedom to actually build on a, you know, execute on a vision to, to go further before you have to start making compromises because sometimes that is, you know, what, what we need just to break through a new technology like this. Uh, I'm not saying you should ignore the real world, but um, maybe once you, your product becomes easier to use and has more maturity, then you'll get a much better sense of which way you actually need, need to evolve. Because right now the pain points aren't that you're mismatched with the market, it's that you're, it's really hard to use these things. Yeah. So, you know, make it easier to use, make it easier for lots of people to interact, and that's when we learn what, what needs are out there that could possibly be met, and that's when yeah. we can start adapting better. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's like, is it a question of do we want millions of people to use this or do we want to build something great that maybe 10,000 people in the world can use and just really do remarkable stuff maybe that's that maybe that's fine maybe that's what creating a real movement is, uh, is about it's not about getting like uh, 10 million people and you're just like growing every year 
Um, maybe it's just really about finding those like 10,000 people that want to strategically work together to make an impact. So or lots of groups of 10,000 people who want to work together. Yeah, but maybe like you kind of find the first one and then <laughs> <laughs> see how that works yeah. out <laughs> instead of trying to find millions. So it's like maybe that's kind of what, what we have to figure out is like, do we want to try to get millions of people in three years or do we want to find those like 10,000 people that want to use this technology effectively to have impact? I think that's a great thought to sit on and close this out. Hey, thank you guys for all the thoughts. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.